But, Your Grace, Scarlow and I aren't the only record engines. We've got twin brothers. Tully Thlin and Dol Goch were built at the same time as us. So they're a hundred too. And they're still at work. Their railway is at Towin in Wales. Please go and see them, Your Grace and everybody. And wish them many happy returns from Scarlowe and Arrhenius, their little old twins. For over 70 years, the Reverend Wilbert Audrey's Railway series has delighted and inspired fans around the world. The books, which have sold millions of copies, continue to keep interests in steam railways alive. The television series, broadcast in multiple languages, has been nothing short of a global phenomenon. Its simple yet exciting stories, rich world and relatable characters have endured, and whether you know Thomas the Tank Engine from the books or show, he has been an important part of people's lives growing up. Many know the names and characters of the main cast, however, there are parts of the fictional island of Sodor that are just as important. Beyond its network of main lines and branchways lies the picturesque Scarlowe Railway, a narrow gauge line that snakes its way through the heart of the island. It's home to a roster of small yet determined engines. Its history spans back to the early days of the island's railways, with its dramatic storylines and engines with personalities greater than the highest peaks of Sodor, to be forgiven for thinking it comes straight from fantasy. However, its engines, its stories and history have a very real analogue, and much of that reality can be found in Wales. The story of the Talithin is one of triumph, of overcoming the odds and paving the way for what would become a global movement. It was also a significant inspiration for a number of the books found in the railway series. Four Little Engines, Gallant Old Engines and others have stories, characters and events directly inspired by the first few years of the Talithin's existence as a preserved line. But what role did Audrey's books play in the continued success of the Talithin? And how has his enduring legacy, 40 years after his last book was published, fed back into the railway with a heart of gold? The history of the Talithin stretches back long before the railway series printed its first stories. Work began on the line in the mid-1860s, first to transport slate from Brynegla's quarry down to Tawin, then a passenger service to meet the needs of the local area. The Talithin was but one of a number of narrow gauge lines that dotted Wales. The Corish Railway, the Festinjog, Welsh Pool and Llanvar, just some of the names that survive with their success partially attributed to the future history of the Talithin. These railways provided a valuable source for linking communities which, for one reason or another, could not benefit from the luxury of a standard gauge line. These lines would adopt bespoke and unique designs for locomotives, and the Talithin was no exception. First came number one and the railway's namesake, Talithin, with number two Dolgoch in tow both Fletcher Jennings designs. These are the only two examples in the world, a truly bespoke and unique part of railway history. Both engines would run the railway together in its first life as an industrial railway, and are still serving to this day on the railway they were built for. While the number of slate loads did not match others in Wales, they were steady, if not spectacular progress. Even as late as 1911, they were still encouraging signs that slate production could be maintained for a number of years. The quarry did not have a particularly exciting past, albeit with a few stories here and there. 
It was, for all intents and purposes, a quiet railway, almost invisible to the outside world. Surviving past grouping and remaining a private railway right up until the end. Its two engines, Tyler Thin and Dol Goch, continue to work, hauling passengers up the valley towards the lake of the railway's namesake and down with Slate, a seven mile time capsule. As the years rolled on, the stocks of available Slate began to decrease. Not through want of trying, multiple attempts were made to continue production, but by the 1940s, following a cave in, Slate from Benegla's quarry would come to an end, and with it, the major lifeblood of the railway. As the Talithin was left patching the hole left by the quarry, a book series for children launched, which would change the fate of its author, and in a few short years, the gallant little engines at Tawin. In 1945, the world was introduced to Book One of the Railway series, titled The Three Railway Engines. These stories focused on the engines of Sodor's standard gauge lines. The series quickly grew, and by 1950, some six books had been published. As the world was being introduced to Thomas, Gordon, Henry and others, for the people of Talithin, their railway story seemed to be at an end. The railway limped along by the help of passenger traffic, but survival relied heavily on those willing to champion its cause. By 1950, Sir Henry Hayden Jones, the railway's owner, passed away, and with it, the final light of the railway. This would seem a fitting end to a small yet seemingly unremarkable railway, doomed to meet the fate of others that closed before. However, this wasn't to be. For in tragedy, we can often find hope, and little did the workers know that they were setting the blueprint for preserved railways around the world. people of the Talithin Railway decided to run it for themselves, to take the operations, risks and costs into their own hands, to keep the railway going for one simple reason, that they wanted to. At the time, this was a completely new idea. The thought of running a railway for sheer enjoyment seemed like a ludicrous idea. It was, however, not totally without merit. A meeting was quickly set up in Birmingham, and following a transfer of ownership of Sir Hayden's estate, the Talithin Preservation Society was born. The group quickly sprung into action. The line was patched up, the engines which had then run for almost 100 years were pulled into some work in order. And by 1951, the first train of the Talithin Railway as a preserved society ran for the public. Talithin was at the time in a very bad state and was retired. Dolgok's gallant attempts to keep the railway alive single-handedly was soon relieved by the introduction of engines 3 and 4. 4, named after the former manager Edward Thomas, with number 3 taking on the name Sir Hayden, a fitting tribute to a man who had championed the railway for many years. The importance of this series of events cannot be understated. The Talithin was the first ever preserved railway, a small, seven-mile, invisible railway had unexpectedly started something which would ultimately take over the world. Up until this point, it could be argued that people saw railways as a purely utilitarian venture. And perhaps, in some ways, the Talithin was also started under this perception, that it would serve the needs of the local community and not much else. However, the novelty of a community railway run by volunteers was quite unique. And those volunteers which had come together to run the railway came from all walks of life. Drivers, cleaners, engineers, and soon a reverend who would help take the story to the masses. So in 
around 1951 um, or 1950 even when the first kind of meeting of the first people involved with the Tallaghlin Railway Preservation Society happened. It was advertised um, in quite a few newspapers um, and one Reverend Audrey noticed this advertisement in the newspaper. Um, but he already had his holiday booked for 1951 to a little place called Wisbeach where he um, saw some nice steam trams. So for the year after, he decided that he would go to Tawin and come and have a look at the railway. Um, he joined the Tallaghlin Railway Preservation Society in 1951. Uh, it was membership number 79. Um, so yeah, in 1952, he came on holiday with his family to Tawin um, and got stuck right in, really. Um, on the first day, I think him and his son Christopher went up to Pendre where the engine sheds are um, and were handed oil cans and told to go oil the fish plates up and down um, the railway up to Ridley Ronan. Um, so they did that um, and got to walk a bit of the line and just really started to fall in love with the place. And then the next day he came down to Tower Morph um, and was told, you are the guard. Here is your flags. Here is your whistle. <laughs> go and guard the train. We do a bit more training nowadays, but back then it was very uh, lax, but it kept the railway going and he became a guard. Um, and he ended up leaving a refreshment lady behind at Abergenolwyn, which went into the stories uh, and witnessed a lot of stuff, which ended up becoming all part of the stories that you see in the books. By 1952, while volunteering at the Talith Inn, Wilbert discussed the idea with the then manager but including similar engines within his stories. By 1955, Wilbert had reached book number nine, but it was the next one which would have an impact on the Talith Inn. Four little engines told the story of Scarlowe, a tired and worn out engine, left in a shed after years of use. He worked on a railway of the same name and alongside his friend Renius, ran the line for 100 years. They were soon helped by two new engines, Sir Handel and Peter Sam. The inspiration from the real life railway was clear. Two gallant engines who kept their railway alive. One named after a lake, worn out and left in a siding. One named after a waterfall, taking on the deities single-handedly. And two new engines arriving to save the day with mysterious backstories and worries that this new railway could meet the same fate as their previous line. One named after a sir, and the other after the general manager. These new engines bore similar shapes to their counterpart, the Talithin, and inevitably, the stories had some grounding in reality. So as Wilbert started getting more acquainted with the railway and volunteering, um, he was asked if he could perhaps write the Talithlin into his stories somehow. Um, and the way Wilbert did this was to kind of make a sister railway on Sodor rather than moving away from Sodor to Wales to keep it all kind of consistent. Um, so a lot of our steam locomotives and diesel locomotives are all in those stories as characters. So for the engine Talithlin, for example, which is the same name as the railway, becomes Scarlowy and the histories are virtually identical and it parallels the real locomotive. Um, and again, yeah, you, so you have the Talithlin Railway and the Scarlowy Railway and the first engine is Talithlin and Scarlowy. So it all kind of reflects. Um, and another, we've got Sir Hayden, which is another locomotive. Um, and that was in those early days the wheels were very thin and the track wasn't very good here so it kept falling off uh, and falling in between the rails where they were slightly warped or um, a bit out of gauge so in the stories Wilbert decided to take that and write it as in being a disagreeable engine and being very fussy so he would always throw himself off the tracks whereas the real reason is that yeah just the, the track wasn't very good but he always used to kind of personify it into a fun little way and yeah so that's Sir Hayden the engine is the real one and then in the stories you've got Sir Handel. The charm of the railway series relies heavily on the personification of the island's locomotive fleet. It was then a stroke of genius that the Reverend used the quirks of each of the Tarleton's engines to build stories and in turn personalities. Sir Handel as a fussy engine, Duncan with his tendency to rock and roll, 
However, perhaps the greatest blend of real life history, storytelling and engine personality can be found in one of the earliest stories, Old Faithful. Like his twin, Talithin, Skarloey was laid up in a shed, potentially to never move again. However, Sir Handel's mistreatment of the Skarloey Railway's coaches in the previous book meant that there was a need to fire Skarloey again. However, while on his journey, Skarloey breaks a spring. Despite this, he braves on, a determined engine who would never see his passengers let down. Through the pain, Skarloey works on, eventually reaching his destination. And his reward? A complete rebuild, bringing Skarloey back from the brink. Much like real life, it was the determination of the preservation pioneers to not let their railway die which led to engine number one, Talithin, being restored to perfect working order. Who can deny that this story, this tale, whether fictional or not, was not inspired at least somewhat by the stoic personality that had begun to grow around the first two engines of the Talithin. It is often claimed by engine drivers that their locomotives develop a unique personality of their own from quirks in operation to the locations they work. This is perhaps one of the reasons why the narrow gauge engines of the Skarloey are so fondly remembered. Despite being diminutive in size, they are grand in personality, and it's these direct inspirations that make them an important part of railway series history. The DNA of the Tanner Thin was seen throughout the first Skarloey book, and as the series grew, so did the inclusion of the four little engines and soon the books became synonymous with the real railway. Talithin itself eventually makes a small cameo in a later book, albeit only a brief reference. The Skarloey Railway, like the Talithin, carried on as an important part of people's lives. The, the, the railway series books were very, were obviously very influenced from, with the, um, with the talent, and obviously with the you have the locomotives, which obviously are twins of of, of all um, of all the Talaclin engines, um, uh, and I think it is because Wilbur Tawdry put into the books that family feeling that he obviously felt when he was at the Talaclin railway, and I think I think it's it's easy to go with the whole old railway with the heart of gold thing can become a cliche, but it, it's really true. It, it's got such a welcoming feeling, and I think. I think it's just. I think it's a very lovely symbiotic relationship between the railway series. I think in the early years, just after the first Scarlery book was published, we did actually have a look at the passenger numbers. Um, and in 1955, when the first book was published of the Scarlery stuff, it was slightly going down on passenger numbers. And then in 56, there was quite a sharp increase. So we can't say that for certain that that's the reason, but I'd probably imagine there was some form of impact from that, from people reading that and like, oh, where's that? Oh, yeah, let's go on holiday. But yeah, so it's certainly given us a good chunk of new volunteers from all over the world, not just the UK. The Talithin was not the only land in Wales which would inspire stories and locations in the railway series. Book 19, titled Mountain Engines, tells the tale of the Caldy Fell, a rack and pinion railway which climbs up the side of a mountain. It shares direct similarities to the Snowdon Mountain Railway, which climbs a Withva. From real-world stories uses inspiration, to the engine designs, to the location. The loss of an engine on the opening day of the Snowdon Mountain Railway, for example, was replicated in the books, and is one of the more tragic tales found within the railway series. The engines of the Caldy Fell never had an opportunity to be flashed out like the others, appearing in only one book and not adapted to television. It does, however, remain a cult favourite among railway series fans. The staying power of the stories can be partially attributed to their layout, containing full colour art for each story. This brings the events to life, and as these railways had direct real-world influences, they in some ways capture the spirit or visual identity of their inspirations. The Skarloey, much like the Tyler Thin, snakes its way up a little valley, in and out of trees and over viaducts, stopping at small, slate-built stations along the way. Mountain engines with this cold, almost hostile environment perfectly captures the isolation of working in such an inhospitable location. This was arguably the finest hour of Peter and Gunvor Edwards, the artists tasked with bringing the books to life after previous illustrators retired from the series. 
They visited real railways, including the Snowdon Mountain Railway, to really immerse themselves in the work. So in some ways, regardless of where the stories are read, Wales goes with them. By the mid-1970s, the Reverend Audrey's run on the series had come to an end, culminated in book 25 of 26, Duke the Lost Engine. This tied up many of the mysteries of the Narrow Gauge Engine's histories. Where did the other engines come from, and who are their real-life counterparts? Inspired by both the Chorus, Vestignog and others, the stories of the Scalloway, Midsodor and Kuldi fell inspired by the Snowdon Mountain Railway, were complete. Wilbert's legacy to the Talith Inn was clear. He had in some way introduced many around the world to the railway. By making Scarlowy and Renius brothers of real life engines, he helped show the world that real steam engines like this existed. The places are real and the stories are real. After Wilbert retired, the series was continued by his son Christopher, who the railway series was written for 30 years prior. He continued to reflect the reality of the real-life railway in his stories. In the 1980s, the Talithian Railway dressed up Sir Hayden as its Scarlowy counterpart, Sir Handel. That story made its way into the books. Even the accident where a tree branch hit the engine smoke box was included. In Christopher's book, Reading Between the Lines, there are numerous references to the real-life railway that inspired the Scarlowy. Old Faithful There were a number of occasions on which the old Tyler Thin's engine struggled on in the face of dire adversity in order to keep the trains running. And this story is based on one of them. In 1952, none of us, I think, expected ever to see the old TR number one Tyler Thin running again but by 1958, she was. And perhaps, in some small way, this book helped make it happen. Father was proud of that. The final Scarlowy Railway story came with new little engines, and with it, the introduction of Ivo Hugh, who shared a resemblance to Tom Rolt, a new locomotive at the Tyler Finn. It's safe to say that the history of both go hand in hand, the meteoric rise of the television series catapulted the series to heights it previously had never seen, and the Scarlowy wasn't far behind. For some, the railway series lit a lifelong interest in locomotive history. The Talithin's Audrey Weekends provide the railway with a much needed boost post-Covid. Modellers, enthusiasts, writers and more use the story of the Scarlowy as a base to create their own tales with the Talithin as firm inspiration. My, my love of railways and now that I, I volunteer on them, it, it all comes down to Wilbert Audrey by, by far in the railway series. So yeah, it's had the biggest impact I probably could say and, and, and on, a, on a mental health level as well, definitely. They, they're the most wonderful escapism to disappear into these books. And again, when, when I'm down at the Talaclin, a few of us have said when we've been engine cleaning, it's almost like its own pocket universe. And it's like, you can't imagine going back to work the next week. It's like when you're at the Talaclin, the rest of the world doesn't matter in a very positive way. I, you know, I think I think the railway series has brought a lot of people into the Talaclin. I mean, I, I live up in the Yorkshire Dales. It sounds bad to say, would I volunteer if the railway series wasn't there? I, I might not have the interest. I might not have discovered railways, I think is a fair thing to say. But the fact that I try and get down in in my holidays, you know, at least a couple of times for turns, and it's, you know, with fuel prices increasing, it's still worth that extra, you know, putting that little bit of effort in. So the, certainly the Scarlowy stories, as they always kind of ended with a, if you've enjoyed these stories, please come and visit the Talithin Railway in Tawin. That definitely had an impact on me as a kid because <laughs> I saw that and I always wanted to come and visit because of that. And I know that's the same for a lot of people. Um, we have a good chunk of volunteers who their first exposure to the Talithlin was the Scarlowy. And the reason that they've come to visit the railway and, hope and then eventually volunteer is because they grew up with those stories. They've come to visit the real thing and then they've fallen in love with it and carried on volunteering. 
The Reverend Wilbur Audrey passed away in 1997, and with it the authority on Sodor history. The books continued for a little longer, eventually coming to an end in 2011. The TV series, however, stayed strong, first with its iconic model series, then CGI, and now animated. Chances are the stories of the little old engines have come to an end, its characters gaining less screen time until they vanish completely, with little chance of the engines appearing in the new reboot of Thomas and Friends. We have probably seen our last adventures of these engines, however, right up until the end, their Welsh influences rang defiantly. So with the book series over, with the TV show evolving into something new, what place does the railway series have in the future of the Tala Llyn? So I, I think the legacy of the Reverend Audrey to kind of railway preservation as a whole is, it has kind of gone beyond those original books because of the television show being becoming such a, a global brand. Um, and on one hand, that has led to perhaps some of the stories being a bit fanciful and not as grounded in the realism or based on true stories as Reverend Audrey liked them to be. But it has certainly helped, yes, spread that those stories across the globe. Um, which, yeah, as we've got so many volunteers come over across the globe because they said, oh, um, yeah, I, I, we had a volunteer come over from Ohio uh, and I asked him, like, oh, well, why did you choose the Tower of Lynn? And he was like, well, it's the world's first reserve railway. But also I remember watching Peter Sam on TV as a kid, so I wanted to come and see the real thing. Um, and I think that's the same just for rail preservation overall. Like, I, I come from a family of no railway people at all. But I'm a very big railway person. I know that's the same for quite a few younger generation. They remember watching Thomas as a kid, so they want to go to Heritage Railways to see an actual steam engine. Or a child who's into Thomas will go to a doubt with Thomas and then develop an interest in steam railways. And I, I think that is the biggest legacy of it, is just keeping steam alive for new generations to come. Yes, it's in a different form, and you know some people grumble about it. But putting a face on a steam engine for a weekend will help get those youngins into it, and continues to do so. So, I think it's something that the Talaklin itself will have to try and keep alive because I don't think the current owners of the TV series really care particularly for the, the railway series. The, the product it just gives them obviously they've got the copyright on that, and then obviously they do what they want sort of thing. But. Um, I do worry about these little books, and I do worry that there'll be children that grow up never discovering these characters. Um, so I think, in a way, I think I think maybe the Railway series for a long time has helped the TR. I think the TR is going to have to help to keep the Railway series going, and I think I think it's in very good hands. Um, I know those that are involved with the within that side of it with the study and the, the Audrey extravaganza and things, so I think I think they're doing all the right things. The Reverend's influence can be seen at Tawin. His study, complete with books, models, smoking, paraphernalia and more, can be found at the Narrow Gauge Museum at Tawin. But perhaps the most obvious way is in the people, both young and old, who come to the railway to see the stories from their childhood, only to fall in love with the location and stay as volunteers. For a number of generations now, the romance of steam can only be found at heritage railways or on the odd rail tour. However, through the books and television show which followed, people have been given a glimpse into the way things used to be, and in turn, encourage those individuals to visit railways throughout the UK. While there's no real way to quantify the numbers who have made the pilgrimage to the world's first preserved railway to see the real life inspirations of the engines they fell in love with at a young age, the unique connection between the Talithin and the railway series, whether big or small, should be celebrated. Wales has oftentimes been viewed almost romantically as a country of plucky upstarts, defying the odds, never letting its size to find its place in the world, and perhaps this is too reflected in both the Talithin and the Scar Louis. Small engines, small stories, but grand adventures. And whenever someone reads the Scarlowy Railway stories for the first time, they see the engines and the location, 
they in some small way see a part of Wales on the page. Despite the series changing, despite the engines of the Scarlowy Railway tipping out of the limelight, while people continue to share the books to younger generations, while parents enthuse their children with the same fascination with railways as they had, maybe the Scarlowy and the Talithin, twin engines, twin stories, twin railways, will be here to stay.